Hey everybody, welcome. Man, do I love it here. We are at Historic Blakely State Park and I am glad to be back. This is only my third or fourth visit here. We got lots to talk about. This is one of Mobile's premier history sites. And the man we bring on now, you know, might actually tell you it's the premier Mobile history site here. But before we do, please share this with your friends uh, so as many people can engage with this history as possible and make sure you're following us on social media. With no further ado, let me bring up the director of the Historic Blakely State Park. This is Mike Bunn, the guru of this area. We're going to walk around with him for a bit. Mike, what in the world is Historic Blakely State Park? Well, we are a state agency of the state of Alabama. We operate on 2,000 acres and we have a variety of cultural and natural heritage attractions here, including 20 something miles of trails. We've got horseback and, and hiking and biking trails. We've got uh, cabins, tents, RV campgrounds and numerous other amenities for people who want to explore the natural area, but of course, our number one claim to fame is that we are a Civil War battlefield, and we're Alabama's largest Civil War battlefield. So we've got a lot of history here from several eras and a lot of ways to explore the natural environment here in the Mobile, Tensile Delta. That's great, and you know, and it shouldn't be a hidden gem, but to a lot of us, you know, it is. it was a hidden gem. Maybe we can get some more people interested now, and you'll come and visit Blakely because, man, these are some of the best works I've ever seen. This is, you know, the, the preservation is so extensive and still growing. So, um, you know, what's the number one reason? What, what is it that people want to see when they come here? Well, what we have here is so unique because it is really twofold. Like I said, you've got the natural environment and you've got the incredibly well-preserved earthworks. And we've got over 10 miles of Confederate and Union earthworks. And we mean not just the trenches, but the approach trenches and the, the rifle pits and et cetera. That's all right here in one place, incredibly preserved so to see that and be able to hike and bike and explore and camp and take our boat cruises and everything else that we offer is a really unique experience for people so it all works together cool and I can attest to that it does work well now we want to actually see some of these trenches and everything like that but before we sort of depart this area where are we standing what's going on right here we're standing as sort of a hub for interpretation for the whole park right here so this is an area in front of readout six is off to our right we'll see that and out behind me is is a common area where we've got the original original town cemetery off to my left, that's the original town of Blakely Cemetery, dates to around 1815, 1818. This is a memorial for the troops that fell during the assault on Fort Blakely. And there's another memorial for a, a former park director here. But this is sort of a common area where we acknowledge some of the diverse areas of our history. Right behind me, I've got a trace of the old uh, Pensacola Road, the very road that Andrew Jackson traveled, going all the way back when he was going to become uh, governor of Florida. And then off to my right, you will see that you will suddenly realize you're standing on a part of the battlefield where the charge occurred, and that is readout six and the Confederate lines. And so you've got all these diverse uses coming together right here. And you may hear off in the background, we've got some campers here. That's our, that's one of our camp, uh, 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 park campgrounds, we hold music events here, we do lots of programming, so this is a central area to explore and experience all the diverse layers of things that Blakely offers. Great, thanks, and I think for a time we also had the world's largest truck right near us, or loudest truck uh, for a while actually idling here, so let's get into this. People really might not know about this, so the history of Mobile spans centuries. But the Civil War history mobile really focuses from 1864, mid-1864 into 1865. And this is happening right at the end of the war. In fact, sorry to spoil the end, the battle here at Fort Blakely is going to take place on the same day Robert E. Lee is surrendering at Appomattox. So, you know, what we have here is the Battle of Mobile Bay in August of 1864. The Union enters Mobile Bay, uh, the fall of Fort Gaines and Fort Morgan. We have other videos about that. And then, as you know, you have Sherman marching to the sea and you have, uh, you know, Hood up in Tennessee, suddenly there's free Union forces to do more things. So uh, you start to have the Union free to roam around this territory. I like to pick up the story of the campaign for Mobile with the end of the Battle of Mobile Bay, where uh, Admiral Farragut actually came up to explore what the Confederates had in Mobile, which at that time was one of the best uh, you know, defended cities in all of North America with our rings of fortification and boats and, and, and artillery works, etc. And he said it would be an elephant to take and take a huge army to hold it. Well, they weren't ready in August of 1864. The Confederates had created defensive points uh, around Mobile and of course over here on the Eastern Shore. And the campaign for Mobile involves the 45,000 Union troops uh, under the command of General Canby, nearly three dozen gunboats, trying to capture these Eastern Shore fortifications and then focus on Mobile. And that's all in the spring of 1865. 
Yeah, so, so that, that was a great summary, much better than I could have done it. Let's walk and talk a little bit, because you, you said something here. I think a lot of people think that when the Union enters Mobile Bay that Mobile falls. Far from it. It's going to be, you know, more than half a year until uh, that is actually going to happen. So um, we are sort of east of Mobile now, and we are trying to, you know, walk up toward the Confederate position here. And these are some of the fortifications the Confederates have constructed. Now, here at Blakely itself, could you give a quick overview? They have redoubts and they have connected lines. Fort Blakely is not one position. It is a three mile interconnected line of earthworks anchored by nine redoubts. Uh, what we call redoubts are really just mini forts where you'd mass men and artillery all connected by, by earthwork trenches. So that's a three mile long line and a big arc connecting on the north and the south on the Tensaw River. That is Fort Blakely and that was the focus of the Union Army that arrived here to lay siege to it beginning April 1st. Of course, there's a similar fortification, a little smaller and a few and fewer men down at Spanish Fort. They began the siege there just a few days earlier. So you've got these two concurrent sieges in early April of 1865, and the goal is to capture them, them so then you can go and walk into Mobile. You could have, or the Federals could have, bypassed Mobile because the Mobile Tensaw River system comes together and you can go up into central Alabama and focus on Selma, Montgomery, et cetera. But if you did that, you would have to leave these posts behind you or a mobile behind you. Canby did not want to do that. He wanted to capture everything at once and then proceed on, and that's how the campaign unfolded. Good, good. And you know, just the idea that the Union can be thinking about marching into Alabama, I mean, shows how by 1865, I mean, the war has come not just to the Confederacy's doorstep, but inside their house. Um, yeah, I literally. mean, it's just an incredible reversal of events compared to 1862, say. Now, you already talked about Canby, you know, but on the Confederate side, you got guys you don't hear quite as much about, Maury and Liddell and uh, Randall Gibson. Anything to say about any of those guys here? Um, they, they were some very uh, talented officers. Uh, there's a funny story about Maury. They said he was every inch a soldier. The problem was there weren't too many inches of him. He was a short guy. He was an overall command of the district. <laughs> here at Blakely, uh, Brigadier General St. John Richardson Liddell was in charge. And he knew he had a huge task confronting him to defend what was an overwhelming force. But you've got to also remember at Blakely, you, the force that was here, 3,500 guys, roughly divided evenly between hard veterans of the Western theater, guys who had served at Vicksburg and Atlanta and Nashville. And then the other half of the Confederate troops are really what they call the Boy Brigade. These are guys in the 62nd, 63rd Alabama who had been rushed into service. Most of them had never seen any previous military service. This is the last draft, the last men, the teenagers who are being pulled into Confederate arms. And he had to rely on this diverse force to defend this huge three mile long line. So you can imagine his, his frustration and figuring out what he's gonna have to do. Uh, but, but he scattered them along this, this three mile long line and as the battle unfolded, you really didn't see a, a huge difference in the amount of defense from one section to, the, to another. Good, and you're already seeing some of the works over here in one of these redoubts and you can walk in either direction, you know, and connect it to another redoubt and another redoubt. So let's bring up the Union here. You know, you've got from my estimation, I think you've got three Union Corps coming down here, all under Canby, one coming from one area, the other's coming from Pensacola. And, you know, one's, one or two are gonna go to Spanish Fort and then one to here, but eventually all the Union troops end up over here at Blakely and it's just, they're gonna outnumber the Confederates, what, four, five to one? Yeah, the, on the ground during the siege and the assault, the Federals, numbered approximately 16,000 men, and the, the Federals did, and then the Confederates, of course, had 3,500. So it's a huge numerical advantage for the Federals. And that siege is gonna begin April 1st, and as we will see, they constructed three distinct lines of parallels getting closer and closer throughout that week-long siege until the final assault on April 9th. And, and that's great. One of the great things about the park is that you can go and see that first parallel and see that second parallel. By the way, not just here, but in other areas because this is a lengthy line. So it's, if you take the time, you can really come to understand these parallels and then it's going to set up. I don't think we're going to give away the end here, but it's going to get the Union about how close to be able to make their final assault. The topography at Blakely is, is a little uneven because there are certain places like where we're standing that we can look and see a few hundred yards out into a ravine where the Federals were approaching. There are some areas that they were a little bit closer um, as, their, as their parallels were being constructed. So approximately for that third, that third parallel was be approximately four to 500 yards from the Confederate lines when the final assault occurred. But of course, with terrain that might vary a little bit. 
and right around, yeah, and there are some re there are some real deal fighting here with Union soldiers stacked up and coming in against the Confederates and whatnot. And I think we're about going to leave it there, but let me just say that this is going to be on April 9th, one of the largest assaults of the entire Civil War. I'd place it in the top 10, and Pickett's Charge is not in the top 10. You know, this is larger than that. I mean, this is a real deal attack. Anything to tease the audience about before we move well, on? Well, 20,000, nearly 20,000 guys involved in an assault over nearly a half a mile uh, in distance with, with guys on the ground representing approximately 20 states. So I would say it's a pretty interesting sort of final bang in Civil War history that often gets overlooked because of the day that it happened. So as we continue into historic Blakely State Park, one of the places that we can actually see is the ghost town, the remains of Blakely. Tell us a little bit about how the fort and the site get its name. Well, they're named after Josiah Blakely, and that name is, of course, Blakely with B-L-A-K-E-L-E-Y. -E -E and on the, the Civil War records, the after-action accounts, a lot of the federal soldiers didn't know how to spell Blakely, so they spelled it with an L-Y, and so Blakely ends up being spelled differently for a lot of places. But the true spelling is named after Josiah Blakely, the way he spelled his name. He founded this place in the early 1800s as a commercial rival to Mobile. He saw right after Mobile came, became part of the United States, and this whole area was annexed by the United States, placed into the Mississippi Territory. He was living in Mobile and he said, this whole Delta system has lots of opportunities for more than one port. And he looked over across on the Mobile of the Tensaw River, which is where we, we are at. And he noticed this high bluff that had been occupied for well over 100 years by various native groups and plantations had been built here. And the Tensaw was a very deep river. He said, I can get boats up there as easily as we could to get, mo to get them to Mobile, if not easier. Planned a town here. He died before it really came to its heyday. But by 1820, this is one of the largest cities in what was then early state of Alabama. It was the county seat of Baldwin County, and it had 20-something different stores and, 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 and establishments here. One of Alabama's first newspapers is published here. Some of the first steamboats in the state of Alabama are built here. So this was a, a thriving place right on the river, right on the main roads that take you to Pensacola and other places, and it was rivaling Mobile for just a short period of time. But the boom went bust by the 1830s. Several factors combined to make Blakely sort of dwindle, and by the time of the Civil War, it was pretty much a ghost town. So as we come here today, we can see traces of that ghost town that the park has reconstructed and interpreted. Tell us about what we're seeing here. Yeah, what you're seeing where we're standing is, is really the old town square. That's one of the original roads that came right through here that we're still following. Behind me are the ghost structures. These are reconstructions of just the frames of some of the structures that stood in the town to help people better visualize what an urban environment looked like in the early 1800s. So we have a home that's based on Hab's drawings of the, of the Travis House up in Claiborne similar structure to the time period that we know this type of thing stood here. And we've got a commercial block that's based on some similar uh, understandings of early Alabama commercial blocks elsewhere that, that, that have a lot of similarities to what we think was here. And so we've put those together with actual newspaper accounts of, of what was here to help people understand it. Because when you're taking groups of any size, but especially school groups, and kids coming through here with no understanding what an early 1800s town looked like at all, and, and, and it was talk about a ghost town, they really are lost. So this helps groups of all ages better understand the built environment in Blakely. We have the uh, the site of the original courthouse. You mentioned this was a, the court seat. Yeah, the yeah. The, what's left of the original Baldwin County courthouse is still here at Blakely. The foundation is left. It was a courthouse and jail, and it stood uh, throughout the, the Civil War, I, I, even even beyond that. And, and Blakely, for a long time after it had been abandoned, uh, it, it remained the county seat until 1868, even though the, the town itself was, was really non-existent. There were still a few scattered uh, homes that were here, and if you're on our property, you can travel throughout these trails and you will see some small piles of brick and other places where homes were, these scattered farmsteads. So it continued to be ha inhabited, but it was not a functioning town by the time of the Civil War, but it, it remained the county seat until after it. Now, I've got to ask, on the way in or out of town along the road, there's this giant tree called the Hanging Tree. <laughs> Tell me the story. Okay, the, the Hanging Tree, oh, there's actually three trees here of significance that they're connected with our history. The Hanging Tree is rumored to be where some of the first public executions took place when the court sessions that were held in Blakely while they were awaiting the, the construction of the courthouse. 
the tree that the, those first sessions were held under, which lies down on the ground now, is called the jury oak, which allegedly is where the court and the judge gathered while this, this courthouse was being constructed. So those are remnants of our early Alabama, early town of Blakely history in early Alabama. And if you go down to the riverfront, we've got what we call the hiding tree, which is a live oak tree with a big hollow space in the base. And that is rumored to be where some of the federal, some of the, the Confederates who were escaping the assault on Fort Blakely, which the fort stood just a few hundred yards out in this direction, they escaped trying to run to the riverfront and make their way over to Mobile. And the story is that some of them hid for safety in the hollow of that tree. The problem is that tree, if it was there at all, was probably about a foot tall. So that probably didn't happen, but it is a wonderful connection to help people understand that the final shots of the battle actually took place in the old town of Blakely. The Confederates were utilizing some of the structures that were here to store supplies. They were utilizing the old dock system to bring in all the supplies for the troops. And when the fort fell, the few people who could ran to the riverfront, were trying to take up boards from the wharves, paddle across the river. Some were actually killed in the river. Some saw what was happening, realized they had no chance, came back, surrendered on the shore of the Tensaw River. And actually the Confederate uh, ironclad, CSS Nashville, was actually nosed up to the Blakely Dock on those final moments, taking shots, and a few guys hopped onto the front of this thing. He had hoped to actually uh, pick up General Lydell, who was made his way down to the riverfront as well, but was forced to surrender as the boat backed off, deposited a few guys, we don't know, maybe a dozen or so, on the opposite shore of the river. But that's where the final shots of the battle took place, right here at the riverfront. So you've given us a tease of the battle. I'm excited for us to go and explore more of the battlefield itself. We're going to continue our explorations of the park. Stay tuned. All right, here we are. We've arrived at maybe the gem of the park, sort of. We're, we're out in front of Redoubt 4, and at this time of year, we have uh, the ability to view all sorts of things that you can't necessarily see in the summer. So let me, with no further ado, let me bring Mike back on, and what's around us here? Well, this is the best spot to appreciate the entire battlefield and all the features that were there, because it's the only spot that's cleared completely between the Confederate and the Union lines, and where you can appreciate all these defenses that were here. So you're standing in this one spot. You can literally see the Federal lines way out in the distance at the tree line. You can see this ravine that they would have disappeared into briefly as they're making their assault and help it gives you an appreciation of the very terrain that's here. You can see the advanced rifle pits. These are Confederate rifle pits placed out in the front of the line and out in the distance you can see a Federal rifle pit as well. You see these features and they're coming up during the charge. You would see that they would have encountered this line of abatis that we've reconstructed and then going on further towards Redoubt 4, you see this line of sharpened stakes. And out beyond that, we have placed some of the stumps of various trees that we've cut down to, to help tell the story of the fact that all these trees most all of them had been cut by the time of the battle and at the stumps they had strung telegraph wire in certain places between them as a trip hazard. So you get to see all the layers of defenses that stood between the Federals and the Confederates that they would have encountered in the assault. The one that you don't see was the landmines. They called torpedoes that would have been out closer to the Union lines. One of the heaviest laden minefields on the entire Confederate line was out in this direction that the Federals encountered. So standing in this one spot, you can appreciate the terrain, the defenses, and get a good understanding of what they would have encountered in that brief assault. So that's great. I mean, between all this, and it's great that we can stand here and see it all or try to picture it in our mind's eyes. I mean, I don't want to see. I mean, I think that you're not beyond putting some subterra shells out here just to make it real. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we won't step on any here. But, um, you know, this is how 3,500 men become 15,000 men. This is how they can have some hope of repelling even a massive Union force coming toward them. In the end, though, uh, the Union's going to move on ahead on April 9th, so let's get right into this. The Union's gotten as close as they could. They've got all these obstructions, and yet they're ordered to advance along the whole line. The whole line advanced simultaneously about 5.30 p.m. in the afternoon of Sunday, April 9th. They had probably uh, planned to do that at some point anyway, but when Spanish Fort fell on April 8th, they were very concerned about the possibility of the Confederates escaping back over to Mobile and doing the whole siege over for a few more weeks and then repeating the situation. They did not want to capture an empty post. They wanted to capture the army. So on April 9th, they issued the, the command that entire three mile line of federal troops, and you can see out in the distance, that's part of that third parallel. That's the closest parallel that they got to the Confederate line, you can see we're just a few hundred yards out. They, they were exchanging fire, skirmish fire day and night at that close of a range. So they advanced all across that whole line and there's a great account 
by um, uh, William uh, C.C. Andrews who talked about uh, the fact that you could stand here where all this area had been clear, cleared on the center of this line, you could look into your left or to your right and see for over a mile in either direction this wave of tr blue troops going over these ravines heading towards the Confederate line all at once. So they're advancing from that line, they're making their way through here, they disappear for a second, some of the guys in this area disappear for just a second in this ravine and when they pop back up readout four the guys there ha can get off basically one shot it's a it's a pale mail rush for readout four the same thing is happening throughout the entire confederate line um, and, and so you end up with battle fort blakely essentially being nine small battles in miniature that that played out um, depending on the circumstances and the men involved in sort of their own way but by about 615, uh, about 45 minutes from the time the assault began, by about 615, every one of them had fallen. They all have their individual stories to tell, but this is the best single spot on the park to understand that, that combined, that, that, that huge charge that came across that few hundred yards of space and the intense fighting that occurred right where we're standing, guys running full uh, blast trying to mount uh, the, the Confederate lines there and the intense personal hand-to-hand -hand combat that took place for just a few minutes all along the Confederate line. And we're walking in their very footsteps right now. Literally. So let's have a moment of zen here and just advance as the Union did. Yeah, this, these guys were, were rushing and all the accounts that we have just talked about the fact that it just seemed to happen in a flash. And they, they were just rushing toward this massive sheet of fire and smoke and flame that was issuing from, from uh, Redoubt 4, not knowing exactly, you know, sometimes we talk about big battles and small battles and there's a tendency to think, well, these guys knew this was a smaller battle so it wasn't as dangerous. This was a defining moment in these guys' lives. A lot of these guys, this was the only major battle they fought in. And in this harrowing experience, they're seeing comrades with arms and legs blown off. Uh, they're, they're seeing all kinds of things happen as they're making their way up to this, this uh, final moment of the attack on Redoubt 4. This was their civil war. Yes. And um, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We're here at Historic Blakely State Park at, at one of the most interesting sections of any park I've been to. And, you know, we'd like more people to see it. Make sure you share this with your friends. Now, uh, when I'm looking at this, and I would encourage everybody watching to read the official records. It takes a little work to, you know, go online and figure out whose report is who and how they belong to it, but that's part of the hunt. Man, if you just, once you, by the time you figure out whose report is whose, you already understand a battle or come to somewhat well. And when I read the ORs around here, as we call them, um, the Confederates sort of know that they're, they're out of time and they have very little hope, but man, are they ready to defend till the end. So can you talk a little bit more about the defense? I mean, I know this was a quick thing. It was over in 20 minutes, but the Confederates put up some fight. Oh, it, it, was, a, it was a really um, a, a, a compelling, a strong stand by the Confederates. They threw everything they had at them as fast as they could. The, uh, once the assault began, the advanced skirmishers ran in. The goal was that they were supposed to stay out there as long as they could. Well, that turns out not to be very long when you've got a, this massive wall of men heading your way. They, they, the Confederates had to hold their fire in certain spots for just a moment as they made their way in, and then they launched everything they had, and it was a withering fire. It was a serious serious maelstrom that the Federals are confronting and all their accounts talk about that, talk about this incredible volume of fire that was issuing there, but they simply couldn't keep up with the with the number of men that were advancing against them and eventually they overwhelmed the position. They forced the, the Confederates actually once the Federals started making their way into Redoubt 4, they actually uh, fell back, attempted to regroup further in the woods, and that happened in a few of the other Redoubts. And the guys here under Cockrell attempted to do that and form a second line in the perimeter of the, of the woods until they were, they were fighting and they were, realized they were surrounded on three sides and they were asked to surrender. And pockets of men had to do that, various parts, ports, uh, portions of the line across that three miles. But So when they storm into the end of these individual Redoubts, that didn't necessarily mean the end of the fight. Mm. Of course, the fight would come to an end, and this is going to be a bloody struggle. And remember this, this, you know, obscured by Appomattox to some extent, same day. And, you know, being later in the Civil War, I mean, this four years earlier would have been the most costly battle in all of American history up to that time. But then you had Bull Run, and then all of a sudden you have battles with 10, 12 times as many casualties as that. So not enough people need to know, you know, know about Blakely. And then there's a substantial result, Mobile will fall. And that's why you can check out the cemeteries in Mobile and whatnot and see some of the human cost of all this. So do you have any parting words uh, for anybody who hasn't been here before, Mike? Well, 
my, my parting word would simply be that this is the place to understand and, and experience what Civil War combat was like, what the Gulf Coast, its history, how it played out in the war. Uh, th this is the spot, and we're a huge park. It's a beautiful park with incredible history, and, and, and as I said before, we, we don't claim to be the essential turning point of the war or anything like that, but what we are is an incredibly important site for our region and, and a place where you can really understand Civil War technology, Civil War tactics, and Civil War battle. The American Battlefield Trust supports that message uh, fully, and you can help us protect more of Sport Blakely. Uh, Blakely. Go to battlefields.org to see how you can help. Um, Mike, thanks so much for having us and joining us. To Chris Mikowski for all that he's tipping in, and to Chris White behind the camera, and to all of you who are watching and helping us support battlefield preservation and education, we thank you.